Welcome. I hope you're blessed in the Lord today. We're going to continue going through Matthew 5, verse 17 through 20. We're looking at this in light of the claims of the Hebraic Roots Movement, where they say that Jesus is teaching here that all Christians are supposed to keep the law of Moses. We've been going through it, and we've noted that no, Jesus fulfills the law of Moses. His teaching, his righteous commands, fulfill the righteous requirements that were only foreshadowed in the Old Testament law. So we've already looked through that. In the last video, we looked at verse 19. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do likewise shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So these commandments, he's referring not to those commandments in the Old Testament law, but these commandments that I'm giving to you here in the Sermon on the Mount and then, of course, elsewhere. His words are what we are to follow. That's why it said in, uh, and so it says that we will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. In other words, we will inherit eternal life. Matthew chapter 19, Jesus said this, if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. Uh, it also says at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7, says this, verse 24, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on a rock and the rain descended, the floods came and the wind blew and beat on that house and it did not fall for it was founded on a rock. So on judgment day, have we been walking in obedience to Jesus Christ or not? Verse 26, and everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be likened to a foolish man who built his house on sand and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on the house and it fell and its fall was great. So reading the words of Jesus Christ can be very dangerous. It can mess with our theology quite a bit. A lot of us are, especially those that are listening to uh, the teaching on this channel, are going to be from a Protestant background. So uh, we we think of anything that sounds kind of like the you know Roman Catholicism or at least what Roman Catholicism is supposed to teach and we get weary of it and we say no no Martin Luther he's he's the great man you know and and what he taught is right and so no it doesn't have anything to do with our obedience it only has to do with us believing there's so much truth in it and so much error also mixed in when we read the teachings of Jesus it will mess with us because we will have to listen to Jesus over Martin Luther or over our favorite uh, hyper grace or free grace teacher on the internet or over our dispensationalist teacher or over covenant, whatever it is that we have, whatever theology we have, we're going to have to listen to the teaching of Jesus above it. But there's going to be some honest questions that we have whenever Jesus says something like, if you want to enter life, keep the commandments. When you read that in Matthew uh, chapter 19, when you read that, you'll be like, whoa, that, that must be hypothetical. It can't really happen. Because we think it's hypothetical because of a couple problems. One, we think in terms of perfection. When he, Jesus says, keep the commandments, keep them perfectly without fail. Okay, well, that's not what he says. He says to keep the commandments. We've noted before in, in the Sermon on the Mount that it, it doesn't expect perfection. It says if, you have some, if your brother has something against you and you're going to offer sacrifice, then go make it right with your brother and then come back and offer sacrifice. So just as in the Old Testament, there were ways for, for cleansing. There was a way for, uh, you know, imperfection was worked into the system in the New Covenant also. We, don't, we have a throne of grace, so we can go to the throne of grace. We can receive mercy. His mercies are new every morning. He treats us not as our sins deserve. He doesn't treat us in this standard of perfection because we're walking in covenant with his son, and so we're walking in the grace of God. As we walk in fellowship with the Father and the Son, the blood of Jesus covers us from all sin. But we do need to walk in covenant with him. Another thought that comes up is, oh, but that means that we're earning salvation. No. Salvation comes whenever we turn from our rebellion and we place our trust in Jesus Christ and God welcomes us back because of our faith. Whenever we're reconciled to God, we receive the Spirit of God, we're adopted as God's children, we are saved in the past tense. But then that salvation is not found in ourself, it's found in Jesus Christ. So Jesus commands us to continue to abide in him in John chapter 15. And he says, if you obey, he says, you will abide in my love if you obey my commandments, John 15 verse 10. So again, not, perf not perfectly obey, but there is an act of obedience because true and living faith is a faith that moves us to action. If we believe that Jesus Christ is Savior, then we will rejoice because we have been saved. If we believe that he is Lord, we will submit to him because he is Lord. If we believe that he is the judge on the last day, we will tremble at his word. It will move us to action. This is what faith is. To make the idea that faith is, is just boiled down to believing a few facts is just simply throwing out a lot of the scripture and trying to focus in on a couple points. So there's there's truth that that is certainly part of faith. It says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says, now, um, it says, without faith it is impossible to please God because whoever comes to him must believe that he is, exists, so you must have a belief, and you must uh, uh, 
Believe that he is the rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So that belief, that faith moves you to action, as we see in Hebrews chapter 11, where everybody that believed something, then it said they obeyed. Abraham believed God, and so he left the country that he was in. Noah believed God, and so he built the ark. It's, they, they moved in action. So that's the nature of faith. But we have these honest questions. And so when we come to uh, Jesus saying that only those that uh, keep the least of his commandments and teach others to do so are going to be called great in the kingdom of heaven. In other words, they're going to be acknowledged in the kingdom of heaven, not cast out as we looked at in the last video. Uh, if, if we do that, then we're going we're gonna to be a little bit questioning, okay, what is the standard of this judgment going to be? Now let's first go to Matthew chapter 25 and start by looking at a, a parable that Jesus gives about judgment day. Verse, starting in verse 30, let's see, 34. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you since the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. So note what kind of actions are expected of those that follow Jesus Christ. They're actions of mercy of grace, of love, because Jesus' law is love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. This includes even our enemies. And so this is what, on Judgment Day, he's going to say to them. Well, there will be many say, well, uh, you know, everybody will quote the passage that says, well done, good and faithful servant, you know, but this is what the day is going to be like. Verse 37, then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see a stranger and take you in and naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? The king will answer, I, I say, to you, tr say to you, as you have done it for the, one of the least of these, my brothers of mine, you have done it for me. Okay, so we see that judgment day is going to be according to the standard, the, the commands of love, of mercy, of grace, of justice. Verse 41. Then he will say to those at the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. I was naked, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. You didn't keep the seventh day Sabbath and make sure that you rested on that day. You didn't keep the new moons. You didn't offer sacrifices in the rebuilt temple. Now, of course, that last part, I'm being facetious and adding stuff because that's not Jesus' law. Jesus' law is not the Old Testament law. It's his law, the law of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 21. We are under the law of Christ. Verse 44, then they will answer to him, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not serve you? He will answer, truly I say to you, as you do it for not for the least of these, you do it not for me. So again, we see the standard of judgment is according to the law of Jesus Christ. Verse 46, and they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now, who are the righteous here? Those that only believed and received uh, the righteousness through faith in Christ? No, they must receive righteousness through faith in Christ and be reconciled to God. But then they must walk in the spirit of God. They must walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, putting sin to death and walk in the righteousness of Christ's law. They are the righteous. So the righteous doesn't mean just that they're counted righteous, but that they are righteous. And they will go away into eternal punishment. Who? Those that have done wickedly and ignored the law of Jesus Christ. So we need to understand that the life of a Christian does mean something for their eternal destiny. Again, we're not earning it, and we don't have to learn do it perfectly. Now, in the issue of perfection, let's go back to the Sermon on the Mount, because often it will be quoted and say, the Sermon on the Mount is only hypothetical to show us that we can't possibly do it, and it's just, uh, it's just a way to show us that we need Jesus and to push us to Jesus. That's not true. Jesus says at the end of the Sermon on the Mount that he expects us not only to hear it, but to obey it. And so some will turn to Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, where it says this, uh, 5 verse 48, it will say, Therefore be perfect, even as your Father who is in heaven is perfect. And they'll say, see, that's hypothetical. None of us can be perfect. It's very true. There is no way that we can be morally perfect. There is no way that as a Christian that we can live. I've, I've walked with Jesus for 30 years. Uh, to say less than perfect is uh, an understatement. There's no way that we can walk morally perfect, never slipping up uh, for, for decades on end. Uh, someone to say, yes, oh no, I, I've lived for 10 years without sin. Okay, 
uh, maybe on the outward, but but our hearts are, are, are quite, uh, quite a mess. And there's a lot of things that we don't know and that we don't see about ourselves. That's why God is continuing to transform us by the renewing of our mind so that we can learn what his good and pleasing and perfect will of God is. Christians are not rebellious. They don't disobey the commands of God knowingly and willfully disobey him on a regular basis. But Christians uh, are not perfect in their knowledge. They don't know all the will of God. So there are things that we do and attitudes that we have that we're not yet aware are in, not in line with the perfect will of God. So we don't walk in perfection. But what does Jesus mean? Therefore, be perfect even as your Father who is in heaven is perfect. Now let's look at the context and see if from the context itself we would be able to understand what Jesus is talking about. Verse 43, You have heard that it was said you shall love your, enemy and hate your, uh, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, pray for those who are spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven, for he makes his sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brothers only, what are you doing more than others? Do not even tax collectors do that. Therefore, be perfect, even as your Father who is in heaven is perfect. In other words... Have a mature love that's not the Old Testament type and shadow to where you love your neighbor who is the Israelite, but you hate the Canaanite. No, in the New Covenant, we even love the Samaritan and we love our enemies. And so that is the fullness of the law. That is the perfection or the maturity of what God requires. But is that really what he's saying here? We can flip over to Matthew chapter 6 and we'll see this confirmed. Luke chapter 6, verse 36, it says this. Well, let's go back up a little and see the context. Um, Verse 32. For if you love those who love you, what thanks do you receive? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do do good to those who do good to you, what thanks do you receive? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those whom you hope to receive, what thanks do you receive? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much in return. But love your enemies, do good, lend, hoping for nothing in return. Then your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the highest, for he is kind to the ungrate, unthankful, and evil. Verse 36. Be therefore merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Luke doesn't say be perfect as your father is perfect, but be merciful as your father is merciful. That's what it means in Matthew chapter uh, 5. So we need to make sure that we don't get these strange doctrines built up on a misinterpretation of one verse, that the Sermon on the Mount is hypothetical and we can't do it because it demands perfection and nobody can do that, so it's just to, to point us to faith. No. It says be merciful as your heavenly father is merciful. Are we going to do that to absolute perfection? No, we will not. But we should walk in that law because that is the law of Christ, to be merciful, to show mercy, to to walk humbly. This is the law of Christ and we're to walk in it. So what standard are we going to be judged on? Let's go over and look at at James chapter 2 because we see this law of mercy written elsewhere. James chapter 2 starting in verse 8. If you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, what's the royal law? This is the law of the kingdom of God. This is the law of Christ, the anointed one, the king. This is the royal law. This is the law of Christ. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. So if you do this, you will be fulfilling the law of the Old Testament. You'll be fulfilling the standard of the Old Testament. If you do this and love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Verse 9, but if you show partiality, you are committing sin and convicted by law as sinners. Now, James' point is not the same here as Paul's point is, I believe, in in Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, or maybe chapter 5, he's saying that if you break the law, if you keep the law on one point, you have to keep the whole thing, and therefore you're going to be under a curse, okay? And so it's talking about the law of Moses. Here, we're talking about something else. We're talking about the royal law, and James' point is that we should be obeying all of the righteousness of the law. Because he goes on, if you sin and are convicted of the law as sinners, for whoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point is guilty of breaking the whole law. For he said, for he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not kill. Now, if you do not commit adultery, yet you kill, you have become a lawbreaker. So speak, verse 12, so speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. What is the law of liberty? It is the law that we are no longer under the Old Testament law of Moses with all the different commands that keep us separate from the other nations, dietary laws, Sabbaths, and and, and all these things, but we're under the law of Christ, the law of liberty. His yoke, which is easy, and his load, which is light, which is to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love our neighbor as ourself by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
So speaking, so those who will be judged by the law of liberty. We're going to be judged by this law. For he who has shown no mercy will have judgment without mercy. For mercy triumphs over judgment. In other words, if we walk in mercy, if we walk in grace towards others, we will be shown grace. But if we disobey the law of Christ and we walk in condemning, as it goes back, let's go back to uh, Matthew chapter 7. Actually, Luke shows this real good because it goes on after... Be merciful. Luke chapter 6, verse 36. Be therefore merciful as your Father in heaven is merciful. Then it goes on. Verse 37. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. This is the law of liberty. This is the law by which we are going to be judged. And so it's not a standard of perfection. It's a standard of walking in grace, walking in mercy, walking in forgiveness and love. Verse 38. Give, and it shall be given to you. Now, I know a lot of preachers will like to use this at the offering time. That's not what it's about. It's about giving judgment, giving condemnation, giving unforgiveness. That will all come back to us. But if we give mercy, we give grace, we give forgiveness, that will all come back to us. Verse 38, give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will men give unto you. For with the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. Don't be judgmental. Don't be condemning. Don't have an attitude towards others that you're higher than them. Don't be proud like the Pharisees, but have a righteousness that, that surpasses the righteousness of the Pharisees. Walk in humility. Walk in uh, grace. Walk in love towards other, in compassion. This is how the standard by which we're going to be judged the same standard that we give out. So I want us to understand that it is indeed true that if we obey the least of these commands of Jesus Christ and teach others to do likewise, then we'll be great in the kingdom of heaven. But if we uh, don't obey them and we don't teach others to obey them, but we teach them to ignore them and we say, no, no, that doesn't matter for your eternal destiny. It doesn't matter whether you obey, that you hear and obey the words of Jesus Christ. You're going to be fine when the winds and the waves and the judgment come. No, my friend, Jesus' teaching is very clear. He's not saying that we earn our salvation by our works. He's not saying that we have to be perfect, but he is saying that we need to walk in his law, we need to abide in him, and we need to bear fruit. I hope this has been helpful to you. God bless.